بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We are continuing to study the third major fiqh rule that states that hardships warrant concessions المشقة تجلب التيسير and this important rule has a number of sub rules they all revolve under the same meaning whenever there's hardship allah azza wa jal makes it easy for us and once you look into the evidences from the sharia ah, you can learn this easily inshallah the first rule we have is idha daq al amr ittasa and this translates to when a matter constricts, it eases. إِذَا ضَاقَ الْأَمْرُ When it's too narrow, then Sharia comes and makes it open once again to ease at the people. And this is exactly what we find in the Qur'an. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ So Allah Azza wa Jalla is telling us that with every hardship there is ease. But people, they are always wanting the solution now. So they're hasty, they're not patient. But if you look at your previous life or what was from your own life, you will find that there are hardships and there are times of ease. And no matter how long the hardship is, it will come to a stage where Allah Azza wa Jal would make it easy for you. So Allah says, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ Examples that when it becomes too tight, then Sharia makes it easy. I want money from someone. And he gave me a date to repay me the loan. And I go and he doesn't have money. He cannot pay me back. Should I kill him? Should I cut his hand? What should I do with him? The man is helpless. He doesn't have money at all. So the Sharia tells me now because it is too tight for the man, it is too narrow for him to maneuver, in this case, delay him, postpone him. And if you can, take the money or the loan on installments instead of demanding the whole amount to be now. Why? Because this is becoming too difficult for him and he's unable to pay back. So we cannot attack him or throw him in jail because even if we throw him in jail, Will he be able to give the money back? He will not be able to work. His family would be lost. So Islam looks at the general concept. Yes, I may find some harm in it, but my harm is not compared to his. The one who has to go to jail and he has to be prosecuted and he would lose his livelihood. Another example is a woman allowed to travel without a mahram? She's not. So this is clear. A woman went to Hajj with her husband, and the husband died. She has no mahram. She wants to go back home. What to do if we do not apply this rule and say, no, she cannot travel without a mahram? Then we have a problem. She will not be able to travel back home, and the country she's in is not her country. No one will help her. No one will give her any money or a place to stay. In this case, the rule applies again when the matter constricts, it eases. And if we did not have this, life would be extremely difficult. Now, the rule says when the matter constricts, it eases. So if I'm in the desert, I'm not allowed to eat dead meat. But if I'm going to starve and die, then it eases. Okay, you can eat from that meat. If 
I don't have dead meat. I have a sheep that belongs to someone who's not here. And if I don't slaughter it and eat it, I'm going to die. It's not my money. Can I slaughter it? Yes. But this is hardship because I am taking someone else's sheep. There's no problem because it eases your situation. Your life is more important than the life of the sheep, normally speaking. But you have to do this in order for you to take away the hardship. What's the ruling on performing forms of worship in return for money? It's totally haram. But if we do not allow some of these things, we have a problem. For example, we have thousands of masjids. Who would lead the prayer? Everyone has a nine to five job and they have offices, they have shops. You can't find someone who would devote himself for the masjid. In this case, yes, it is permissible for us to give the imam and the mu'adhin money because otherwise they would not be able to do this job. Likewise, teaching the Quran. I need a Quran teacher to teach me. But I can't find someone who is free and the one who has time, he says, sorry, I have to go and work. So we tell him, no, you teach our children, you teach in a school, you teach in a university, this ilm, this knowledge, and we will give you money. There is no problem in that because the Sunnah has approved of that. As in the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, may Allah be pleased with him, when a man was bitten by a scorpion or by a snake, and one of them gave ruqya and charged 30 sheep for that. And the Prophet approved that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second rule is a famous rule in Arabic. This is a fiqh rule that is very famous. It's called al-darurat to be hul mahdhurat. Three words, as usual, because all these fiqh rules are made of two or three words so that it would make it easy for you to memorize. And in English, this means that necessities permit the unlawful. But this has another rule that we will go through that governs it. Because I may do a lot of haram things, unlawful things. And when someone tells me, why are you doing this? I say, it's a necessity. No, this means that if you reach a level of hardship, then doing unlawful things becomes permissible for you. And from the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَمَنِ اضْطُرَّ غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَاد. Two conditions. If you are in a necessity, Allah says, but if one is forced by necessity without willful disobedience, nor transgressing due limits. So two things that govern this, that you are not willingly disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal. And secondly, you are not transgressing the due limits. This is found three places in the Quran. And also this applies to a number of things that you don't disobey willingly and you don't transgress the due limits. I give you my car for safekeeping and you put it in the middle of the highway, turn it off and leave. After one day, you will find hundreds of cars hitting it and going. Why? He said, Wallah, you gave it to me for safekeeping and I'm sorry, this is what happened. Am I sinful? Yes, I am sinful because I have disobeyed willingly and did not do what I was supposed to do. Someone gives me the car to use and instead of abiding by the speed limit, I go top speed until the engine breaks. And I'm sorry, I used it, but sorry, this is what happened. Do I pay for it? He said, no, you're my friend. No, you have transgressed and you have exceeded the due limits. So when we come to this rule that necessities permit the unlawful, you have a lot of examples. Someone who's stranded in the desert is the best and usual example. Now, is it a necessity? He will die. What is unlawful? To eat dead meat or pork, then necessities permit and allow you to do the unlawful in this 
case. Also, what's the ruling on me going into your house and taking money? It's haram. You're not allowed to do this. If I gave you money, I lent you money, and you're not paying back, I go to the court, the judge sends someone to take by force your money and give it to me, equivalent to the loan. So this is a necessity that made the unlawful. Otherwise, my money would go and I would not be able to protect my wealth. A third and final example, if someone came to my house uninvited, and I know that he is a criminal, he wants to do harm to my house. What is the ruling on me attacking him or shooting him or even killing him? Normal cases, this is forbidden. But if I'm in my house and I say, oh, I cannot kill him, I cannot hit him. And he comes and kills me or does things to me or takes my money. And this is hardship. So in this case, Islam tells you, you are permitted to do the unlawful. Having said that, a lot of the brothers who have guns, they would say, oh, I wish I find someone breaking into my home so I can shoot him between the eyes. This is haram. This is not permissible. What is, I want to defend myself. Yes, defend yourself from the lower to the upper. So tell him, don't come or I'll shoot you. He's still marching. Shoot in the air. He's still marching. Shoot him in the leg. He's crawling on his belly. Shoot him in the arm. He's still trying to come. Then you may kill him. But not from the first instant you immediately kill him. No, in Islam you have to prevent him as much as possible without reaching the highest point. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right back. Scientific notions in the glorious Quran are among its endless aspects that can testify for the divine nature of this noble book. These scientific notions are probably the best addressed to the people of our time. I am Zaghloul al -Najjar. Please join me in this program to discuss some aspects of the scientific notions in the glorious Quran. <laughs> Appreciate the word-to-word -word authenticity of scientific notions and proven facts mentioned in the glorious Quran 1400 years ago in Scientific Notions in the Glorious Quran. Every Saturday at 11 p.m. and repeat telecast at 12 p.m. UK on Peace TV. Where truth is hidden, misleading quotations create confusion. Where truth is hidden, lack of knowledge and wisdom cause upheaval and commotion. Where truth is hidden, manipulate scriptures and twisted facts emerge. This very hidden truth creates false propaganda, mayhem, chaos, disorder and turmoil in our lives and the world order. But is there anyone with courage and wisdom? What is the truth? And who has the courage to expose it? Because it's your right to know the truth. Watch truth prevail and lies perish 
in Truth Exposed by Dr. Zakir Naik, next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. If you want to do something that is unlawful due to necessity, you have to choose from bottom to up. Don't go to the maximum, which means that if I'm stranded in the desert and there is only this unlawful meat for me to eat, don't go and eat until you do your best in finding something that is halal. For example, if you found someone and this someone has food, halal food, but he says, I'm not going to give it to you unless you pay me money. And you have a choice, either you die or eat from the unlawful meat or pay for the halal meat. What to do? Wallah, Sheikh, money is difficult. And if I pay money, I'm going to die out of, you know, depression. No, you have to pay money because this is lesser than losing your life. And this is lesser than eating haram food. We move on to the third rule, but do we have any questions that are related? Okay, let's take the brother there. Assalamualaikum. You said that a woman cannot travel without a mehram. So, if a woman is traveling normally, now like within a mother's they travel in taxis, so is that allowed or not allowed? Because it's, also, it's for long distances also and short distances also. So is that allowed? Okay, first of all, when we say that a woman is not allowed to travel without a mahram, it's not me who's saying this. This is the Prophet ﷺ, hadith. But you have to understand the words men. In English, we say, I travel to work every morning by bus. But traveling here is not safar, not actual word in Arabic, which is, لا يحل لمرأة تؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر أن تسافر إلا مع ذي محرم. Safar here means to travel outside of the city borders. So if you go from one side to the other side of your city, though it is three hours by car because of the traffic jam, and maybe it is 70 or 80 kilometers, but you're still considered where? In the city. So this means that this is not traveling. A woman can travel without a mahram. The second important issue is there is a difference between the prohibition of traveling without a mahram and being alone with a stranger in a car. The first one is traveling without a mahram. The second one is khulwa, seclusion, being alone with the opposite sex. The Prophet said, no man would be alone with a woman except the third one with them is shaitan. And what would shaitan do to you? Ask Allah for forgiveness. Fear Allah. Would he advise you like this? Definitely not. And this is not the appropriate place to speak about what he will advise you to do. So this is different. If a woman travels to work or to college with a taxi driver or with a chauffeur, this is not permissible. She has to have someone. So two women with a man, no problem. Because there is no khulwa and this is not traveling. Yes. Sheikh, as you were talking about the issue of the mehram, like a woman needs a mehram. Uh, so there were a lot of dispute uh, that I was coming across. People are saying that there's a concept of group mehram, like uh, if you're aware that one woman has one mehram and the rest of the women can travel for hajj, etc. Especially for hajj in this case or other places, whatever. So is there a concept of group mehram in the hadith or it's not? Okay. The hadith that I have mentioned earlier, the Prophet said, alayhi salam salam, that it is not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah on the day of judgment to travel without a mahram, was said to the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. And when the Prophet ﷺ said this, a man stood up and said, O Prophet of Allah, my name was drawn to an expedition, peace be I'm going for battle. But my wife went for hajj. So now you're telling me that it is not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah and the day of judgment to travel without a mahram, what can I do? The Prophet ﷺ immediately told him, go and be with your wife, accompany your wife, meaning leave the expedition, leave jihad and go and accompany your wife. Scholars say that from this hadith, 
We understand that what is known as group mahram is baseless because the Prophet did not ask والسلام, the man, is your wife alone or with other women? He did not ask him whether she's old, 70, 90 years old, or young. He did not ask him, is she beautiful or ugly? Meaning that there is no condition, no permission for any woman to travel without a mahram. And that is why the Prophet told him immediately go and accompany your wife. So I hope this answers your question. Yes. Sheikh, this third rule about that hardship warrants is from where do we get these rules such as al umur bi maqasid the other rule we, we got from the hadith innam al amal bin niyat. So this rule that hardship warrants is from where do we find this? Well, this is found by the ayah inna ma'al usri yusra. This is one. Always with hardship there is ease. Also, I told you, if you remember in the beginning, that a lot of these legal maxims or these qawa'id fiqhiyya is obtained by either one, the evidence from the Quran and Sunnah, as in the al-umur bi maqasidiha, that actions are by their intentions, or by the consensus of scholars. If they agree on something, as in the rule of lajtihad ma'an nas. There is no opinion accepted when there is evidence, as in the case of group mahram. So one says, yeah, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they used to travel and they used to fear on a woman traveling on her own without mahram. Now we have airplanes. So if I take my wife to the airport and she boards a plane and her brother would receive her from the other end, this is halal. This is called ishtihad. Now I'm applying my mind and coming with a verdict, with an opinion. But the consensus of scholars that there is no ishtihad when there is evidence, the hadith is crystal clear. You cannot travel. Yeah, 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 but Sheikh so-and-so said, Akhi, the Prophet said, والسلام, you cannot travel. And the consensus of all scholars of all schools of thought that it is prohibited for a woman to travel alone with the exception of Shafi'i and only in Hajj. But his opinion is, overwhelmed by the hadith. So this is number two of getting these fiqhi rules. The third way of obtaining them is through general reading. So when you read more and more and you find that all the evidence is Allah Azza wa is making it easy. So if it's difficult for you to fast, then this calls for ease. This calls for concessions. And that is why you remember we mentioned the types of hardship that calls for such ease, whether it's traveling, whether it's illness, whether it's forgetfulness, etc. So this is how the scholars get this. So I hope this answers your question. My question is uh, related to the example of the, um, if a man is stranded in a desert, and for example, like uh, uh, he has something other than uh, haram meat, for example, there's a dead palm tree. But now, if it is not have easy access to the halal food, so in that case, can he eat the haram food? Because, like, for example, if there's a dead palm tree, then it's not easy. Like, first of all, he's stranded, he has very low energy, and, like, you know, climb up and uh, catch the dates and eat. So, what in that case? We spoke about a similar rule that states what is not usual takes the ruling of the impossible. So, if it's not usual, for you to get that halal food, then it's as if it's not there. So you have to refer to eating haram food. You cannot sit and say, well, I cannot go and get these dates from the palm tree. And this dead meat is in front of me. I cannot eat it. So might as well die. No. Again, you study these fiqhi rules to come to such conclusion, which is, I cannot get there. So this is as if it's not there to begin with, I can eat. And one would say, okay, maybe, Sheikh, maybe. If he waits a little bit, it will fall by itself. This is imagined or real? Imagined. We took another fiqhi rule that tells you that what is imagined is not accounted for. So don't sit and say, inshallah, it will fall. Or maybe I'm like Maryam, I will shake the palm tree and it will, no. This is something that is not applicable. Yes. Questions? Sheikh, 
my question is for example if a person is stranded in a desert and as you had mentioned for he is only having a sheep and it is halal for him so if he slaughters and eat it so does he have to pay to the owner or is it recompensation for that also will he be left for that okay the scholars usually give an example of a necessity and when you ward off this necessity or this harmful thing to you what are the implications and we will get to study this inshallah in the following fiqhi rule but generally speaking in a nutshell if a camel attacks you now this is hardship what to do you have to have a concession that allows you to do something that protects you from this camel so you kill the camel does the owner have the right to come and ask for the money scholars say no why because you protected yourself from that thing this is different to if you fell hungry and you're going to have until we meet next time fi amanillah wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh